Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Love Heals. The TV news business can be murder. The PJ Santini series, book three by Lynn Russell. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter one, the morning after. So how was your night? I asked him, gulping Colombian roast from a diner mug with somebody else's lipstick on it. On general principles, I try to start off the day not remembering what I did the night before, even if it was my fault. Men do this, and they wind up carrying a lot less baggage into the morning. For men, every day is a new adventure. Nothing we think we taught them in the previous 24 hours makes it through the night. But I knew exactly how Daly's night had gone. We'd been caught up in the moment, mixing business with pleasure, and things had gotten so far to, out of hand, I was going to have to retire the number on my favorite French lace red teddy. I was trying hard not to think of it as love, but who wouldn't fall for him? By breakfast we, my private detective boss Tango Daly, and I had put ourselves back together and had gone on to wrap up the paperwork on the 2 a.m. Gra graveyard shootout. We hadn't hung around Buffalo's oldest and finest cemetery to talk to the cops, and they still hadn't come for our version. Why not? The coffee was cooling off fast under the paddle fans, and the guy in the next booth was having trouble lighting another cigarette in the breeze. This worried me, because only a cop would chain smoke in a place like this, with no smoking signs everywhere, and not even order toast. He also was making notes while we talked. Daly caught it, too. Somebody obviously thought, maybe hoped, that there'd be more to our story than we'd write into our official report, and they could charge us with obstructing justice. They'd have to go through every detail, and it would take some time for them to fabricate the rest, but the danger was there. It was always there. What should we do? I asked him, rolling my eyes toward the cop. You're exhausted, he said, his voice soft and his quick smile aimed right at me. I wondered if this was just for effect or something more. That would be new for a big, tough guy. He patted the table and swept his hand to the right to signal, be patient, be quiet. We've done everything right. I'm waiting to hear from the police so we can cooperate fully and give them all the information they need. He said it slowly so the goon with the pen could get it all. When the adrenaline had worn off this morning and all the discharge of a firearm on a case forms had been filled out and filed, we left Daly's Iroquois Investigations office on Elmwood Avenue in his fancy black BMW stealth mobile to do a postmortem here in our other office, First Watch. First Watch is a place where you can get eggs, bacon, and home fries all day and all night. Situated enough blocks away from Iroquois to be convenient, but still not on the radar. It has lots of windows for a good view of the parking lot and a mirror on the back wall if you had the bad luck to sit facing the wrong direction. This particular mirror had an extra asset, an emergency exit conveniently located right next to it. Back in the day, this entire chain of diners was built the same way, very popular with private investigators who have to meet the unstable clients and sources, people who are one group therapy a session from making the front page. You don't want them coming to your office. We'd been playing with our food for 15 minutes, giving the precinct every opportunity to approach us if they wanted to, when my cell phone blasted its new ringtone, Magnum P.I. The old one was Mission Impossible, the story of my life. Magnum was more carefree, but he got the job done and was cut some slack for his mistakes. I figured, change your ringtone, change your luck. It's Benny. Benny Levin, the crime reporter from the Buffalo News. In New York State, people actually still read the paper. I like to think it's because they see the value of holding the written word in their hand. My father, a retired police officer who runs a cold case operation out of his basement, has a different theory. If you try hard enough, you can still get high off of newsprint, Pop says. You do the math. The phone's vibrating dance across the scarred formica table was mesmerizing. I'm not answering it. Answer it, Daly said, glancing over at the cop who looked to be about 13 years old and on his first surveillance job. He was tall and beefy, but Mom probably wouldn't let him go out for football. His head was cocked toward us like an Irish setter waiting for a treat. We were pretty certain nobody knew the whole story, and why should they? We'd done nothing wrong unless it's a crime to narrowly escape death at the hands of two homicidal maniacs who happen to be in the same place a graveyard, for God's sake, at the same time. 
and they weren't even working together. Information about that would definitely be on a need-to-know basis. My job was to give the newspaper enough to stay friends, but not give the eavesdropper anything that would fill in the blanks for the man perpetually out to destroy me, Chief Homicide Detective Frank Longoria. I asked Benny why in the world he was calling me, of all people. With 900,000 residents in Erie County, New York, and 250,000 of them hunkered down right here in town, he calls me? I got you on a tip, he said. From? From a reliable source. And who would that be? Or is it a secret? No, no, no secret at all. In fact, he said you'd ask, and he said I should be sure to tell you exactly. It was Detective Frank Longoria. He said to tell you he's head of the BPD Hamas. I know where he works, I hissed. Easy, PJ, don't let it show. Junior crime fighter over there will write it down, and Frank will know he got to you. I told him to hang on and put down the phone. Yo, could we have a warm-up here? And no cream. Don't dilute it. Yolanda Gomez is the most intuitive waitress ever. We've had lots of discussions about how coffee and certain other things in life are strictly to be enjoyed and how extras like cream are really essentials. So she picked up on that, the no cream, and on the building tension and the need to buy time. She poured the boiling hot coffee very slowly. One deep whiff of its pungent, just-brewed aroma had sent little men with jackhammers up into my sinuses, kick-starting my prefrontal cortex into creative thinking. The coffee was so strong, pulses of seismic explosions flew across brain synapses that had thought they'd never see action again. When the idea finally came, I turned the tables on Benny. I decided to manufacture a false lead that would send them all away. I probably shouldn't tell you this, Benny, stage whispering through another mouthful of coffee. But if you hear there's an out-of-country connection, that's out-of-country. It's true. It's very hush-hush. I'll say no more. So then, what I've heard is right. I promise not to tell a soul, Benny said, as he pulled up the number for his contact in racketeering division. Chapter 2 journey. Well, there it was. Longoria still wanted me gone. I'd known him all my life, and he'd always been the one who didn't play by the rules. Juvenile delinquent makes good. Worse than that, he was in tight with the mob. Very tight. And he knew I knew. I could probably prove it if I had to. Probably, if I didn't mind jeopardizing my entire family, including the ones who also engaged in Frank's questionable sideline, like my connected cousin Sandro the Eel DeLeo of the Belleville, New Jersey DeLeos. Ma thought San Sandro was adorable. My best friend Vicky thought he was hot and was engaged to marry him. I couldn't help liking him for the fuss he made over me and the times he'd help out when I was working a case, like interpreting threatening notes written in mob speak. Pop saw the rest of the story in a penal kind of way. Family gatherings worked out as long as the food and the wine lasted. Daly dropped me back off, dropped me off back at Iroquois. Sitting at the curb out front in my beloved silver Mercedes SLK sweet boy, it was still early in the day. I wondered what new hell was in store. They'd be waiting for me at the television station where I was more or less steadily employed as an investigative reporter. If I showed up now, the news director would be leaning in my office in two seconds, sending me out on a job nobody else would take. It didn't matter how adept I was at developing great crime stories to him, I was just lowest lane. Granted, the crime stories wound up involving me, but that's not the point. I was about to act like an adult and go on over anyway when a call came in from Chickie's Pawn Shop. Chicky Vecchio was an old buddy of Pop's on the Organized Crime Task Force. He'd come across a thing that maybe hangs on a necklace. What do you call him? A thing? An amulet? It just came in. A guy I know. He's got a pawn shop in Belleville in New Jersey. Once a month he's here. I don't ask why. Just for the hell of it, we trade a box of stuff that didn't sell. This thing's interesting, but not worth much. Kind of old and broke. Speaking of which, he said, why don't you come around and say hi to your old uncle Chicky and have a look at the same time? I really needed something in my day that didn't come with complications, so I jumped at the chance. You got it. Be there in ten. But I was still wearing clothes messed up from crawling around in the cemetery. Not my best look. 
With no time to change, I threw the gear shift into park and popped open the back, the trunk of miracles. It's filled with useful investigative toys, including blonde and brunette wigs, makeup case, hard hat, clipboard, dark blue windbreaker that says official on the back in subtle block letters, eyeglasses with no correction, and bowling shoes I found at Goodwill. And Oreos. Also, by chance, a bitchin' pair of Christian Labatin Le- 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 black leather stiletto ankle boots, smooth as butter, that I'd spent a fortune on, but hardly ever wore because they were made for just one thing, and it wasn't walking. On the other hand, shoes like that could change your day. That and the attitude you'd need to show up in them when the rest of your clothes looked like you'd just come from a casting call for an undead movie. I took Wilming over to Chester, then deliberately overshot the target and did a U-turn, winding up a good distance from the shop and from whoever might be on his way in with last night's take. Chicky's pawn is on every professional thief's speed dial. Not that Chicky knowingly accepts stolen property. In fact, he makes so many calls to robbery division at the precinct, they should put in a hotline. But face it, there's a better than average chance the goods are so new they still have barcodes and the original owner's breath on them. Chicky was waiting with a big bear hug over by the jewelry display case. It struck me that he and Pop had worked together so long they'd begun to look alike. Round face, thinning gray hair, twinkling Italian eyes, and both with a penchant for khaki slacks and paper-thin thousand-year-old white t-shirts. Also, because of their line of work, both were uncommonly aware of life's twists and turns and of the passage of time. I had a look at it, that broken amulet. It was more like a weathered coin, weighty enough to roll around in your hand with a sort of squiggly design. It felt pleasing, but oddly uncomfortable, impatient for the moment to be over. My grandmother, you know Nana Giovanna, she's here from Sicily. She says everything comes with its own vibrations, I told him. And damn, this definitely has something to say. Tell you what, it'll never sell. It's gold, but only good for scrap. Take it. I give it to you. He was a sweetheart. It came in with a bunch of other stuff. I think it has some history, you know, goes back in time. Maybe you'll figure it out. Or give it to your grandmother. I hear she could use something to take her mind off that the Harley dude. You know about that? I couldn't believe there was so little going on in Buffalo that Nana's love interest would make the headlines. Never a dull moment at the house, eh? Your pop told me. He was real worried about his mother. What could a supersized aging hell's angel see in a pint-sized ancient Sicilian broad? No offense. None taken, in a way, the appeal is easy. Nana embraces life with complete abandon. She's exactly the female you want on your hog, hanging back in the sissy seat, screaming into the wind as you rip off a liquor store and peel out at 60 miles per hour. Yeah, but again, with all due respect, she don't know she's left the old country. When the bitch in broad riding behind you is all is all in black, showing off boots and fringe, it's supposed to be motorcycle boots and leather fringe, not black high top Oxfords and a Palmero shawl. Capiche? Well, it's all over now. I told him he dumped her for a forty-year-old hairstylist with a special talent for you should pardon the expression, blow drying. Oh, Capito! Chicky understood perfectly. When I first became a cop, you, they told me that whenever you look for a motive for something, you should always start with money. Since then, I've revised it. Never underestimate the power of the BJ, he winked. Now, don't go telling your pop I talk about that with you. He thinks you're still nine. Thanks, Uncle Chicky. I'm going to go change clothes before I face the family. I gave him a kiss on the cheek and heard him call out as the bell jangled on the front door. Tell your pop I've got a lead on a cold case that's about to turn very hot. My condo is downtown, six floors up in a ten-story building right on Lake Erie, luxurious by my standards. The road from there to the part of town known as Lovejoy has been traveled in happiness and sadness, but always in the knowledge that it was home, the place I grew up. The few square blocks where my family has lived since Dominic and Margie Santini fell in love at a St. Agatha of Cantania church supper, got married, set up shop, and brought my brother and me into this world. Italians from the old country dubbed it Iron Island because it's in the middle of a nest of railroad tracks. Not the most glamorous part of Buffalo, but a testament to family values, love of country, and personal responsibility. And an appreciation of what those things can bring to you and to the people you touch in your life. If you can stay out of jail. That's frequently an issue. 
If you can't, you might be running into former schoolmate Frank Longoria, ironically no stranger to jail time himself. Or you could meet my brother Tony, a cable guy with ADHD and big plans to open a Sicilian seafood restaurant called The Garlic Cove. Or my best friend Vicky, who's studying up to be a mafia princess whether she admits it or not. I don't think she realizes how high her hair is getting. If Sandra gives her any more gold necklaces, something spinal is going to pop. Vicky runs Balducci's Love Your Dog, where canines can get pedicures and star treatment for a day or a month. So when the car tucked into the safety of the garage under my building, I swiped the Electro Pass and took the elevator up to the apartment that, with, that my designer shoes allowed me to share with him. Locking the door behind me, I yearned to sleep until tomorrow, wearing something soft and amorphous, who's gonna see it, sitting up in bed first with comfort food, maybe mashed potatoes. But duty called, so I put old Lovejoy clothes out of the closet. A nice fitted white Brooks Brothers no-iron shirt and black jeans with a lot of stretch. Before I'd finished backing up for a look, the full-length mirror was screaming, Catholic school, you're back in Catholic school! So I untucked the shirt and unbuttoned it down to where my mother would have a fit. Then it was obvious that the best shoes would be the ones I'd just taken off. The Louboutin red-soled ankle boots with the impossible heels.